Good afternoon. My name is Anne Seven Engelen. And speak up. So, good afternoon. My name is Anne Seven Engelen from the School of Oriental and African Studies. I'm a lecturer in law there. So I have two quick questions. The first one is about how much you're ready to negotiate access, how far you're ready to go. I've actually worked for the IC ICRC, collaborated uh, with MSF. I more or less know your limits. I want to know if you're ready to push them further in terms of, for example, using Islamic medical ethics. So contextualizing, contextualizing in a sense, for example, looking at religion or gender issues. That's my first question. My second question is uh, One now. One question, but OK. <laughs> uh, oh, s very quickly. quickly. I'm very aware that there's no one from the IFRC here today, but I was wondering whether we could address the issue of international disaster response law. International disaster yeah, yeah. response. Law. International disaster Thank response you. is not yeah, all right, but it's a bit on the edge. But okay, we'll come back. One more question from somebody there, please. Name, organisation, at the back. Yep. Oh, it's here. It's Mark. <laughs> Thanks. Um, Margie Buchanan-Smith, um, Independent. Um, the kind of implication, and if I understood it correctly, is that as the number of agencies has proliferated, that kind of all those agencies need to understand international law, need to have the skills to negotiate access. And I'm just wondering, what is the model for the future as there are more agencies? And to what extent do different agencies um, doing their own negotiations actually hamper another one? Um, or, and should we just be looking to the UN to do it on behalf of, of all? Mm -hmm. Thank you. One more, perhaps. Yes, Andrew. Thank you. I'm Andrew Whitley. I'm the policy director at the Elders Foundation. My question is about the uh, chilling effect of counterterrorism legislation on um, humanitarian NGOs and conflict mediation organizations. At present, under US law, it's possible for Secretary Kerry to give a waiver for individual organizations to deal with designated terrorism organization X. Does the panel have any views about longer term solutions of how to be able to deal with this problem? Yeah, thank you. OK, shall we take that lot first? And then I'll go to the online questions. Uh, who would like to start on? So as question about uh, medical ethics, religion, relevancy, applicability. Do you want to start on that? Uh? Sure. Uh? Um, thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, so Islamic me medical ethics. <coughs> um, I, I think it's it's a very timely um, it's a timely question and it's a timely issue. Um, the uh, in ICRC, it's something that's on our radar screen. I would say um, it's something where. We are um, with our network uh, of um, Islamic decision makers and and uh, imams and etc. Uh, looking at what I would kind of loosely describe the overlap between international humanitarian law and and Sharia law. Um, so yeah, it's 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 not the start of the process. Um, we were doing some work in, in northern Mali on this as well and in other contexts, um, but it's uh, I, I would say it's very much a work in progress. Can you hear? Can you hear? Yes. Okay. Good. Thank you. Um, Mark, you want to say a word on? Yeah. I mean, I think uh, you know w one of the things I like about working in MSF is is that we we there tends to be always someone who takes wherever we are today and decides well we should go further, um, and I I think that breaching <coughs> breaching medical ethics I think would probably be something that as a medical organization we would really struggle with, and I I'm not sure. I mean, maybe there's uh, specific examples where, where it wouldn't be quite the breach that we think it is, but I, I think that would be a, a line. I think one of the things we struggle with today is, is essentially, you know, that, that principle of humanity is that we're all equal, we're all part of the same human family, and yet uh, our teams are saying we don't want any British people there, we don't want any uh, <coughs> white colored people there, we don't want any Christians there, you know, basically profiling, uh, be, becoming almost a, a norm of uh, access to uh, employment opportunity. Uh, so, you know, is that a compromise uh, of a fundamental principle of, of essentially equality, or are we allowed to discriminate because we're innately good as a humanitarian organization and we can take these decisions? And so, uh, you know, we, we, we struggle with these things. Um, I just think, yeah, the, the debate is alive and well. And uh, I, I think the other thing is just, uh, you know, we do spend some time looking <coughs> back on those, uh, th those compromises we've made and to see if they were worthwhile or not. Um, 
Maybe just quickly on the, the question that came from the back about lots of agencies. I, I, think, I think the presence of lots of agencies even sometimes the presence of, uh, uh, you know, no more than, you know, four or five is exactly what uh, extremely practiced uh, 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 negotiators on, in governments use to whittle away, uh, you know, uh, the humanitarian community. A little bit what Sarah was talking about. Our lack, our naivete is just astounding. Um, you know, it's also, you know, I, I found as a, as a lawyer uh, uh, by background, I, I was being out negotiated by junior doctors in Sudan on a regular basis. I mean, there, there, there was something just about the, the ability to get roped up and, and, and it, uh, let me stop there. Uh, <laughs> no, but the, the, the point is we drew lines in the sand and you go away for a few years and you come back and you can't even see that line anymore. It's, it's hundreds of meters away from where at a certain point, because the UN, the, the, I'm sorry, the international community is not coherent. And as soon as somebody breaks rank, it creates that, that spectacle of, wait a second, they've agreed to the new visa requirements, what do you mean you're not going to? Yeah. And it, it becomes impossible. Yeah. The solution of allowing the UN to do it sounds like the only thing worse than, uh, than, the, 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 than that situation of just uh, the, the chaotic uh, negotiation of individual NGOs. I, I know at the very least, the UN is not a, a neutral actor. They, they, they are frequently on the side, in particular, of governments. They, uh, they have sanctions on governments. They, they uh, are part of peacekeeping forces that are very specifically in place, such as in Congo right now, to support the government side. So um, I would say that yeah, having the UN negotiate on our behalf doesn't make any sense. <coughs> what, what I would do, and what, of course, nobody in, in my organization will listen to me, is you simply hire people who know how to negotiate uh, like any other business, you just mm -hmm. hire people who do that for a living and tell them what you want and see if they can get it for you, as opposed to, you know, we'll 30 foot, you know, we'll uh, apply. 30 <laughs> foot, <laughs> you, you can have it. Um, <laughs> you. But, you know, uh, right. uh, uh, you, I'll Mark. leave it there. Sarah? <laughs> Thanks. I was going to. The last uh, two questions in particular? Yeah, no, address the, the chilling effect of counter terrorism. Yeah. Um, and, and again, you know, we've done quite a lot of work on it, and I guess the only long term solution is to, you know, engage with these governments to see if, you know, to, to try and push for a humanitarian exemption to be, you know, built mm -hmm. into um, the legislation. But the reality is that <coughs> as humanitarians, we often engage and negotiate and advocate with the wrong bits of government. You know, we deal with uh, our humanitarian counterparts who are actually very sympathetic. You know, and if we talk to people um, in OFDA or, you know, in, in humanitarian departments of the, the, the government of Canada or Australia or the UK, they're very sympathetic. We need to talk to the treasuries, to the home offices, you know, to those who actually don't understand um, the implications of, you know, this, uh, um, of this particular uh, regulations and the impact that they have on delivering aid. Um, th those are the ones where you know the, the engagement is needed. But we continue to, to, in a way, preach into the converted. You know, they're on our side, but they have an uphill struggle in government to persuade their colleagues. And I think we, you know, our advocacy is misplaced, so it needs to be redirected and be a lot more, you know, consistent and persistent in many ways. Yeah, interesting that uh, governments with anti-terrorism legislation are urging some groups to talk to alleged terrorists and even do so themselves. <laughs> so I guess they can prosecute themselves if they really want it to be consistent. Anyway, yes, thank you. Two questions. Can I put it to you? I'll read them out and perhaps you could comment on them if you think they're interesting. Abdurrahman Sharif, the operations manager of Muslim Charities London, says, the humanitarian system is perceived to be Western-led. Can we change this perception by including other actors from, for example, the Islamic world and ask them to negotiate on behalf of Western actors, e.g. in Somalia and Al-Shabaab? So there you are, Mark, maybe. Some new negotiators or uh, blending. And I'll link the second question perhaps from Twitter. How can you be non-political when your impartiality is mainly politically derived and governed, says Mohammed al from Hand in Hand for Syria? the Syrian British Medical Society. Mm. So two interesting comments, any interesting thoughts? Yes, sir. Yeah, um, so on, on the first point about um, expanding the, um, the, 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 the structures or the mechanisms to include Islamic um, organizations, 
I, I would t I'd have two comments. The first one is that I don't believe there's a huge queue of humanitarian organizations knocking on the door wanting to join the kind of Western coordination structure. That's the, the, the first point. Um, uh, and the second point is w that's probably with some justification um, because we really need to, to get our act together, I, I would say, in terms of the existing structures. Uh, I'm reminded of the kind of Groucho Marx comment about, you know, saying that he wouldn't join any club that would have him as a member. And, and I, I would have a certain amount of sympathies for uh, people outside of the system, and th there is an analogy there. Um, on, on the second point, on the, the politicised um, aid, <coughs> there is, a, there is a, an obvious development in the Security Council, I would say. When you look at um, Somalia and when you look at um, Mali in particular, <coughs> where we are moving towards a more politicised aid from the, um, in terms of the UN response, um, it, it has been agreed that there will be an integrated political uh, development, humanitarian, military response in Somalia, and that will be all under the same umbrella, basically. <coughs> and we're moving in the same direction in, in Mali. <coughs> so there are issues there, <coughs> excuse me, around the perception of what it means to be a humanitarian. Can you se call yourself a humanitarian if you go into a country where you're being, you're under the same um, uh, chain of command as a military force that's actually conducting an a military offensive against a party to the conflict? Can you call yourself a uh, humanitarian if you're going uh, about your business with escorts being provided by, by those same uh, military uh, people? And in ICRC, w we uh, indeed with our colleagues from the British Red Cross, w w we're having some discussions uh, that says, look, let's try to redefine what it means to be humanitarian. And maybe in contexts where you have such an integrated response, it's not um, viable to continue to call yourself neutral. It's not viable to continue to call yourself independent. Um, but that the kind of common glue that defines humanitarian response is to say that you are, of course, you, you act in terms of humanity, alleviating humanitarian suffering, but as Sarah and Mark have also pointed out, you act in an impartial way and we're, we're those are discussions that are, that mm -hmm. are ongoing. But you, you must remember Mr. Blair called Kosovo humanitarian war, and I remember we had a general <coughs> of NATO there who called himself a humanitarian general, so, you know, I'd be interested to hear what you think about that. Well, that's exactly what we're trying to avoid. <laughs> I mean, it's the humanitarian airstrikes as well, I think, in Belgrade at one site. Yeah. New form. Mark. Yeah, I, 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 I was trying to get away from work uh, uh, about two years ago, and I was watching that latest uh, Star Trek episode, and... Uh, they were trying to convince, th there was a little bit of a speech inside to the young James T. Kirk trying to convince him to join the, you know, the, the, the Federation. And he <coughs> said, the Federation is a, a humanitarian armada. Mm. And I thought I hadn't heard that, that upping the game. <laughs> you know, um, you know they, they have proton torpedoes that can destroy entire galaxies at a single moment, and they're humanitarian. <coughs> Save um, lives as well. Yeah, probably. Uh, <laughs> it's, so it, I, I, I agree with Brian. That's exactly what we want to avoid. And I, and I have a feeling that <laughs> the idea that we Western organizations could, you know, kind of stand near non-Western organizations and try and hope that they help get it, I think that's exactly what they don't want. The, uh, first, I, you know, I think if they want to say we are different, if they want to say to governments we're different from that lot over there, we are not going to come in uh, and, you know, be the, the agents of the West, and we're not going to come in and disrespect your sovereignty and speak out and publish human rights reports and all of those things. I think the last thing they want to do is be associated with us. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I, and I think we will, we will increasingly have to engage. You know, I, I think at the, at the moment of the expulsions from Sudan, President Bashir said, you know, you agencies, if you want to help the Sudanese people, you know, fly your aid in, leave it at the airport, and we'll yeah. get it out. Yeah. Uh, you know, we don't need right. you guys here to do it. Right. Um, and I think, uh, I, I think Brian uh, did an almost perfect job of answering that other question about, you know, there is, of course, the things you, in, in a highly politicized context, uh, in the places where we work, it is impossible to do almost anything that doesn't have some kind of political ramification. But that's different from having it aligned in terms of its intentions and objectives to political intentions and objectives. You know, saving a life, sa saving a Tutsi life at the time of the Rwandan genocide was a, is a political act. But I don't think that agencies came in with the idea of we want to save 
you know, we're we going to come there to save Tutsi lives uh, in, in or because we think they're better than the Hutu or something like that. So I, I think it comes back to that, that intentionality and it is, it, it, it is probably just much more important the perception of what we're doing. You know, w w you may have a completely neutral or independent intentionality uh, but what is it that uh, I I what is it that the perception of the ground, uh, I and do they do they trust? Do the people on the ground trust that you're there uh, solely uh, on the basis of uh, of compassion for the uh, for people in need? And if they don't, then there's very little you can say to to reverse that. Okay, thank you. Do you want to add, Sarah? Well, just, I mean, again, uh, I also think Brian has, has really um, exhausted the answer, but just to say that you know, I, I also agree that this, the, the dialogue with the, the so called new actor is essential on a number of. Dialogue with? With the, the so called, I mean, everybody calls them the new actors. Mm -hmm. I really don't yeah. like the, <laughs> the new because they're not new. new and I think the work we, we're doing in HPG shows that there is a long tradition, mm -hmm. um, you know, on, in, in many parts of the world, not just in the West, of, you know, organizations that have uh, provided a Assistance and you know would consider themselves humanitarian. Now it's understanding you know the evolution of this humanitarianism, you know the principles and the values that have uh, um, informed you know the evolutions of these different traditions from ours that is essential. And this is the kind of work that we are trying to do. You know, really looking into the history of of other organisations that are not part of the so-called traditional institutionalised system, if there ever was one. Um, and, and you know, the, we, we're engaging through this, through the you know, this this pro project that we have on global history of humanitarian action, but also engaging, you know, on, uh, uh, looking at regional responses to to humanitarian crises. And for me, you know, as we we, we do this work and understand and learn more, you know, about different perhaps. Um, points of entries, but actually quite a common history that, you know, is very intertwined because I think that's what's coming out of the research, you know, over, over the years, you know, and over the last kind of century and a half, really, a history that is not in any way, you know, in isolation or independent, mm -hmm. but very much cross-fertilized. Um, I remain more and more convinced that what matters at the end really is the impartiality. You know, if, uh, if a, 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 a provider wants to be called a, a humanitarian organization, humanitarian actor, it is the impartiality that will characterize the action. Otherwise, they're a relief factor, which is, which is totally legitimate and you know totally fine. But that's very different, you know, from from a humanitarian organizations that is driven by humanity and impartiality. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I must say again, I can't resist this. You you won't be surprised. I hear we, we keep talking about humanitarian action. It seems to imply relief delivery. We don't hear much about protection and human rights in IHL, do we? It's actually said the heart of humanitarian Yeah, we, 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 some of us believe that, but I'm just a, always struck in these discussions that it tends to be about delivery of aid, but I guess that's natural. Okay, we'll take three questions from the floor. There's one there, one there, and one there, and then we've got two online. Can you announce yourself uh, with a microphone? Who's got the microphone? Please. Bit, bit brief because we're running too long. As usual. Yes, good. Uh, Neem Juguna from Nakuru Environmental and Conservation Trust. Question to uh, Brian. Uh, you say there is no queue mm -hmm. of these other agencies coming. How do you know that? Uh, that there is no queue. The second thing, do you really, are you saying you want to get your house in order first before you can invite other players, and yet at the same time you don't want these other players to come in to help you m put your house in order? Good, very good. Brief. Please, at the back there. Uh, my name is Warsame. I'm here independent. Yeah. And um, I have a few questions. Number no, no, one. No, 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 no. <laughs> two maximum. Two maximum, okay. I'll, I'll do two. Uh, number one is uh, when we talk about humanitarian access, are we talking about being there or reaching those who need and also making sure that they get what we said that we are giving? That's one, mm -hmm. or, or chest presence. Uh, number number two, how in uh, when I hear the name humanitarian access negotiations, uh, is there such thing in uh, that's overboard, that is common to all humanitarian organizations, or is it individualized that uh, each negotiates to their own uh, niche, which most probably compromise others? and also create a perception. Okay. That's Thank my two. Thank you. Thank you. Please here. Hi, I'm Rebecca Sharkey from the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons. 
I'm coming at this from a bit of a tangent, but uh, my question mm. is about the role of NGOs in preventing humanitarian catastrophe. In particular, we've been working with the International Red Cross, which has really transformed recent uh, ef ef um, efforts at humanitarian disarmament of nuclear weapons. So the qu question is the so role, the of, role NGOs of NGOs in preventing. In preventing yeah. Okay, okay. Okay, thank you. We'll just stop there for a second. I think the uh, uh, panel then will start. But uh, Brian, your name, so you better start here about your queue and getting your house in order. Okay. So thank you for the question. Um, how do I know there's a there's no queue? Um, I'm guessing, I suppose, but it's an educated guess um, because I sit on the um, I represent the ICRC on something called the Interagency Standing Committee which is this committee which brings together all of the uh, UN bodies that are invel involved in the humanitarian sphere, plus all of the international the consortia representing international NGOs. Uh, and it, it's an issue that's very much on the agenda of this uh, interagency standing committee. And I haven't heard of any direct request to, um, to join. But um, am I saying that we get our ha house in order first? I'm saying um, if we don't get our house in order first, we'll be not attractive or not attractive enough to those um, uh, those humanitarian agencies that are outside of the system, basically to you know to make it I attractive for them to want to join. Yeah. Okay. Uh, sorry, I just lost all the questions. It's, it's coming back. Uh, <laughs> I can help you with that if you like. <laughs> sorry, do you want to get that? Yes, no, actually, I, was, I, I wanted to address the question on, on access <coughs> and whether it means, you know, being there or actually um, really um, uh, uh, sort of <coughs> offering um, assistance and protection to people. And I think this is a very interesting question because it's at the heart of the debate because I think for too many organizations, access has become about presence, about you know, almost planting the flag and being there in whatever way, whether they're there physically or not. And that you know, also entails re remote management, organizations that are actually not present, not able to assist, not able to offer protection in many ways, um, working through others very often. And our study you know, on humanitarian negotiations or negotiations with the Taliban in Afghanistan shows it not knowing what their staff are doing on the ground, you know, not having a very good understanding of the engagement um, locally, uh, but you know, wanting to be seen as being there. For the same things that Mark was alluding to earlier on, comms departments like that, fundraising, their donors want you know, them to be seen in certain places, and that's very different from you know, the communities actually uh, really receiving um, support, both in terms of receiving assistance, but more importantly, as Dennis was stressing, actually, um, you know, being um, able to acquire <coughs> protective benefit in terms of, you know, support uh, of these organizations to, you know, reducing the exposure to, to violence, to threat, you know, to, to deprivation. Um, so, yeah, no, I, I mm -hmm. very much like the question. Good. Mark? NGOs yeah, maybe, uh, yeah maybe, maybe, though, uh, one quick thing there, and I, I do think I think a lot of study, you know, ODI, for instance, a lot of good work is being done, and inside organizations, we struggle with the idea of our access to a place, and I do think, uh, you know, it really has to push beyond that to people and people in need of our aid. But we don't put as much effort into the access of people to us, uh, and, and, and uh, you know, even when you get somewhere, what, are the, what is blocking people's access to us? We've been in places in the heart of crisis, mm -hmm. and people were not coming through our door, mm -hmm. Uh, and that that's a bit more difficult to, it, it's just we seem to see it through this lens of our access to them, and I think the other lens is just as important. Um, prevention, I, I mean, you know, I mean, you might be able to predict MSF's response on this. You know, of course, in a refugee camp, one of the things we do to save lives in the immediate term is a, a measles vaccination campaign. But in general, uh, so yeah, prevention works. But in general, I would think it's, you know, you, you kind of you don't ask the firemen to go around and do all of the work to build homes that are safer. Um, I do think that for the most part, where we want our limited resources and skills and experience is devoted to reaching people. You know, the, 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 in the immediate and solving those problems. And you know, whether it's the kind of development or you know disaster risk reduction or resilience, it gets a lot of different names. But those those ideas of trying to reduce the impact of humanitarian disaster when, and catastrophe when they come, 
absolutely vital work, but I just wouldn't ask the humanitarian organizations to do it uh, necessarily. Mm -hmm. Of yeah. course, our work, our, our, you know, I if you're in, you know, if you're in Port-au-Prince, Haiti right now, and you're reacting to cholera, it, one of the things it will do as a byproduct is leave behind a lot of medical personnel who are trained in how to react to cholera, which didn't exist in the country before uh, it was brought in by the United Nations. So, um, that wasn't good. Uh, oops. <laughs> Watch it. Um, so, you know, it, it, it is, I think that role of prevention is vital, but I just think it, <coughs> it, it belongs to other people. And I guess maybe one last comment on prevention. Maybe if we do talk about what we see, uh, you know, and merely make it real, uh, th there is no, uh, may, maybe to a certain extent we would hope that it, it, that, that helps to prevent. Um, I'm not so sure. <laughs> More often, we just get question of whether our aid isn't prolonging war and prolonging catastrophe. Uh, and that, yeah. uh, hopefully, nobody will ask that today because it's, it's. Thank you. I, I, I think it's, it, it also depends on the crisis and it's more nuanced than that. I mean, yes, there are crises and especially acute you know, crises and crises where you know, you're deploying in, in the middle of the battlefield where, yes, our role uh, as humanitarians should essentially be you know, about saving as many mm -hmm. lives as possible and, and alleviate suffering. Yeah, the reality is 80% of what humanitarian organizations do take place in protracted crises where you know the, the prevention element yeah. the recurrence of the crisis is so obvious and so expected that it's almost criminal not to engage you know to, to, to just prevent this you know the, 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 this crisis from repeating year on year and because unfortunately humanitarian organizations continue to be the only ones deployed in some of these contexts you know eventually it becomes a, a bit of a vicious circle you know we continue to respond according to very finite time frames short term inputs and you know pretty much same emergency supplies year on year but the response that is really needed is developmental response and is how how to get you know development colleagues to operate in a context that they see as too volatile and perhaps because of political um, considerations, you know, is seen as just humanitarian and, you know, whatever that <laughs> label means in, in, in emergencies, actually. Um, yes, and, and, and uh, basically it has continues to have the same wrong response year on year that doesn't serve the interests of the communities. In many ways, you know, we, we in HBG we call them shared spaces, but these spaces are not shared very well, you know, are spaces where you, you need both humanitarian and the development actors to work together addressing the same problem in different ways, you know, and from, from the different angles and, you know, maintaining this capacity to respond to the flare-ups and the acute, you know, moments uh, while, you know, working on, on a much long-term trajectory, you know, to address what is essentially development problems, but we're still a long way away from doing that. Okay. Thank you. I think, you know, perhaps there's a long discussion here about prevention, but I mean, well, it's I not... Well, yeah, you're a bit wide for this, I think. You know, don't ask the humanitarians about prevention of conflicts, let alone... working in partnership with campaigns, I think it's Yeah. Well, you know. Anyway, it's a long discussion. The world's arms suppliers are on the Security Council which authorised peacekeeping, so there's some fundamental problem there uh, that we could perhaps have another round table about. <laughs> but um, not now. Uh, Brian, quickly, and then we've got yeah. two questions here I want to come, and then I'll come back to you. Yeah, just very... Very quickly on, on the nuclear issue and prevention. <coughs> um, I mean, one thing is crystal clear, and we, we l there's a lot of talk in recently about um, North Korea and the nuclear threat. Threat. The 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 we need to state it very clear that <coughs> humanitarian organisations, um, if you put together all of the capacity of the nu the uh, humanitarian organisations, mm -hmm. we will not be able to deal with the consequences of a hu of a nuclear attack. And and for anybody to, to even think that we would is just totally um, totally misplaced just just on access the, the question from the gentleman uh, in the back there um, just to, to to frame it what we've been discussing here today is about access in uh, situations of conflict <coughs> and clearly we do need to, to state that in actual fact the good news is that I in in uh, situations where <coughs> there are natural disasters of which there are unfortunately many th n a lot of these access issues around security around um, uh, blurring the civil military lines etc simply don't exist so I, I did just mm. want to flag okay. that okay we're running against the time so I think I'll do one of the two questions on here perhaps only because we're running out so sorry Jeff we won't get to you uh, but Joe says MSF Amsterdam I'd like to ask the panel for some comments brief comments 
on the links between public communications, advocacy, and access. Positive, he heard and, you. positive <laughs> and negative <laughs> mark. <laughs> <laughs> Briefly. <laughs> Please. I'll call Joe afterwards. Call Joe. Um, no, look, I mean, it, I, I think it, it, it's an overly simplistic formulation to say that because agencies speak up that they, uh, that they run the risk of being kicked out of a country. I, I think the, the, the history of the planet could be defined as not where the, the meek and the quiet uh, gain some respect, but where you have to make a bit of noise and you have to have that the, the, uh, that is part of respect for you. I mean, you know. The quiet organization, um, uh, you know, it, it, it is not possible in some ways to defend humanitarian space without the use of public, you know, public protest when it's being violated. And I think, you know, people, I think, often mistakenly, uh, uh, you know, juxtapose MSF to ICRC. And, uh, you know, I think over the last few years in particular, we've been in MSF very, um, you know, uh, very reluctant to admit that ICRC has stood the ground of defending independent humanitarian space, for instance, in Sri Lanka, at cost to their own operations, but because there's something about def you know, defending that space in a place, e you know, even when there will be repercussions. And I, 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 think, I think in general, uh, w without that public defense of it, uh, and without that, that very, very, uh, uh, that willingness to, to take a bit of risk and, and, and speak publicly, we'll have trouble. The second thing, though, is a completely contrary position, is that, you know, states are no longer tolerating our neo-colonial, we come in and we start lecturing them on what they're doing wrong. And it might be that that model, we all believe in humanitarian protection, we all disagree with the idea that aid agencies should deliver aid, you know, the well-fed dead, but it might be that that model is on the verge of extinction and, and we don't know it yet. Yeah, and I guess the other comment is, is that different forms of advocacy. I've always uh, admired, I guess, ICRC's willingness to withdraw or to cease operations, which the UN seldom does. UN senior officials expelled with impunity around the world, plenty of examples, and once that happens, there's very little leverage left. So I think that's something that might be a form of advocacy in a different way, and it's a it's a brave form, I think, in many respects. Okay, we've just got a few minutes, so if I could have three but very short questions. One lady here, but please be brief. One gentleman there, and one, okay, two there. <laughs> Special <laughs> favor. We're gonna have a wrap, yeah, but not yet. <laughs> very brief, please. But you, you please be brief. Thank you. Here, here. Um, who, I mean who are you and where are you from? Um, Women for Justice and Peace in Sri Lanka. Okay. Um, the UN organizations were ordered out before the humanitarian rescue started. Humanitarian rescue meant uh, so many bombings and shellings. Right. But um, uh, as soon as the war was over, uh, ICRC was not allowed to go into the battle zone, but the people who were who emerged out of the battle zone, were variously injured, and there were people on the floor, they were tugging at the clothes and okay. the feet of the people who emerged. But ICRC was not allowed to go in there, but nobody was allowed to go in there, but the whole place was shut down, and they built a memorial on that ground. Okay, question. So the people, what happened to the people who were there, unable to get out? Has anybody questioned that? That's your question? Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Please make it question focused, sir. My question is really short. Right, um, what proportion of your funding comes from the government? Can say again, sir. What what proportion of your funding comes from the government? And then sec secondly, That's right, when you have when you have the government um, um, of England and America talking about right raising fund from the friends of, I mean, uh, uh, um, Syria. Right. I mean, where are this phone going to? Are this phone getting to you able to? I mean, uh, deliver humanitarian aid, and how is it possible for you to get access when when there is no pers um, okay. I mean, uh, 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 neutrality, neutrality in such a situation. Okay, funding and access. Over there, there, and then Sasha. Um, hi, Chris Scott. I'm um, Chad Sunt. We're a sort of project management company working in some of these strange places. Um, I'd like to bring us back to the subject of professionalization of negotiation. 
Um, I understand uh, Mark shouldn't feel bad about being at negotiated by a young doctor and, um, uh, because, of course, that's what they do in their day job. They're very good at it. Um, and I won't ask um, Sarah how many of her team were trained, professionally trained negotiators. Um, as an outsider, I've always been very struck that in the um, aid business, um, and I use that term advisedly, um, so little attention is given to actually professionalizing <coughs> the training of their negotiators. Mark, you said you would like to um, you know, have tra professional negotiators you know, in certain circumstances. I understand why organizations don't want that. But what I would like to do is to sort of ask the organizations why they don't train more of their people in negotiation skills. Okay, good question. Okay, why don't you train? All of us. Uh, Sorsha Callahan from the British Red Cross. Maybe as an extension of um, access for what purpose, um, access at what cost. And I'm kind of reminded of, of Darfur, maybe South Kordofan today, Somalia, where the attention of the world is focused on getting aid agencies in and maybe not on the issues on the ground um, and where access is used really as a political hot potato or gambit um, mm -hmm. to draw attention sometimes from what's happening on the ground yeah onto the access of humanitarian organizations that can often do little um, relatively um, to, to meet the needs of the people on the ground. Okay, thank you. That's it, I'm afraid, from the questions. We'll just go quickly through the panel and then we'll have a final word or two. Uh, Brian, do you want to start? Sri Lanka and Yeah, others? just a question from funding. the lady on, on Sri Lanka and uh, I'm happy to take the funding question as well. Um, I'm, I'm not an expert on, on, on Sri Lanka, <coughs> um, um, but one of the issues that I am aware of, and it's not common only to Sri Lanka, is a question of um, an organization's mandate after the conflict comes to an end. Uh, and as is often the case um, for ICRC, we, we have uh, very good access during the, um, during the hostilities, but then at the end of the hostilities, sometimes governments will come to us and say, well, you know, problem is solved, no need for anybody working with Geneva Conventions in, in our country, uh, and it's time to move on. Uh, and um, I, I understand that that was one of the issues uh, in Sri Lanka. Um, on funding, the um, what, what proportion of the um, funding, well I can speak for ICRC obviously, c comes from government. The, the answer is um, uh, the vast majority of funding comes from government. <coughs> um, and that's, um, ICRC is in a fortunate position um, in this respect. I mean, one could argue that as governments give us a mandate under the, the Geneva Conventions to be the guardian of IHL and to provide protection and, and assistance, there's also therefore a responsibility to finance those um, um, statutory um, tasks. <coughs> But the other more important point I think that you're getting at in terms of access is how can you be independent when all of your money comes from the British government or the uh, US government or the European Union? <coughs> and I don't know whether this is a convincing argument for you, but it's a certainly a convincing argument for me. Uh, and I've worked in places like Iraq and Pakistan. Uh, uh, um, and the answer is earmarking. I mean, what happens is that governments... Um, because of the, 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 the level of trust that they have in ICRC and our ability to provide uh, a response, um, provide very loosely earmarked uh, money. So what that means is that the British government or the US government don't give money to ICRC and say, please spend it in, let's take an example in 2007 or 2003 onwards. They don't say, please spend it in Iraq. They'll say, please, there's a, a contribution, you decide based on your independent assessment of needs, whether you want to spend it in Iraq or whether you want to spend it in, in Eastern Congo. And it's that level of earmarking from which uh, independence derives. Thanks. Yep. Thank you. Sarah, do you want to respond? On, on this, well, I mean, I don't know how much interest there is in the, in the funding of... No, <laughs> no yes, but we have, a, you know, it's the, same, it's the same answer, actually. I mean, the, the, the our ability to do independent research comes from funding being being unearmarked to the humanitarian policy group, which is not the same as the rest of ODI, but we have been able to develop a, a relation with our donors whereby the funding that comes to us is largely unearmarked, and you know that's how we maintain mm -hmm. the independence of our research, and I think it shows in, in the type of 
topics and you know that we we choose to tackle um but no on, 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 i think the one I'd, I'd like to to address is perhaps the professionalization of negotiations because <laughs> i think that's a, a very important and uh, um interesting you know issue at the heart of uh, how we engage you know in espe especially on uh, in situation of combat um and you're right, you know, you don't need to have professional people, but you need to train people. And I think we have a lot to learn from the ICRC about the investment in training of their <coughs> delegates. Um, I think it's a lesson for a lot of the other organizations that want to, to, to fill stuff in similar terrains. Um, actu actually, uh, you, don't you don't all have to, you know, agree in the same um, sort of, I don't know, you know, somebody was talking about should we have the, the UN co negotiating for the others or should <laughs> they, you know, <coughs> would one confuse the others? No, but if they're all trained um, in IHL and trained in negotiating professionally, you know, the results won't be very different because you'll be engaging in a consistent manner. You'll be engaging, you know, with the knowledge of how to um, really engage with these actors. Uh, actually, a lot of people that are on the ground uh, have no idea you know, how to um, even open conversations with. So I think that's at the heart of what we should be doing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, maybe just to say, uh, MSF, uh, at least in, in 2012, 87% uh, of our money came from private donations, just people giving us money, and 13% from governments. And you know, we would not take any money, for instance, from the US government. Uh, we don't take any money from any government for conflict zone, uh, for conflict work. So, you know, I, 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 going, I come back to that point. I, I completely with agree, with, agree with you. If you're taking money from, in particular, from a belligerent party, uh, it's very hard to proclaim your independence. And <coughs> people, when we are negotiating access, in particular non-state actors, now they ask you, where do you get your money? And they can look it up on the internet and do. Uh, they, they, you know, so we can say, oh yeah, we did use some money from that government in Malawi, but they're looking that up on the internet in the northern, you know, in the caves in Pakistan. So uh, it, it is, we're, n we're now in a world where you can't, uh, where, where financial independence is something that we are able to be questioned upon. Um, I think just professionalizing negotiation, we, you know, we try, we do have, we hire trainers, we send our heads of mission to it. I've participated in, in some of these trainings and I have to go back to what Sarah said. It, it, it's surprising how, how poorly developed that skill is. Uh, uh, and even just mock, you know, mock uh, uh, sort of, uh, you know, things like you're, you're in a car and there's a checkpoint and they won't let you go. And the inability to, to, to you know, harness the power of humanitarian principles and apply them, as opposed to just saying we just want to go there. We we we're we're good. It it, it it's very surprising. Um, and uh, lastly, just you know, Sorsha, you know, you know what you're talking about is the humanitarian fig leaf. The fact that right now you can you know almost the real clamor is uh, it, it, uh, from the politicians. You might say is you know, at some point yes, of course they want uh, in a place like Syria for uh, uh, the, the the situation to be resolved. But when it, it, it is very useful to be able to say we're, we're pushing, we're pushing, we're pushing for aid agencies to be able to get in as if aid were some kind of solution to what's really going on there. And, I, you know, um, you've probably yourself written on that, uh, you know, just what is the cost, and, uh, you know, uh, of essentially performing that fig leaf role of as a humanitarian organization um, being seen as a response to what is uh, 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 you know, a violent political conflict when all, all you really, you know, our job is Band-Aids. And to allow that job of putting on Band-Aids to, to absolve other actors of what is their responsibility is something that's very difficult. And we probably don't raise our voice in protest of that enough uh, to, you know, uh, in terms of protection and independence. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, this is according to the program wrap-up time. Um, never try and wrap up a humanitarian <laughs> discussion where there's no consensus, so I'm not going <laughs> to wrap up. <laughs> but a lot of consensus. I think that the, the agenda speaks for itself. It ranges, and I'll ask the panel to add a word of wisdom here or correction. I think for me it ranges from the limits of the reality, reali reality of the limits of humanitarian action, which I think is very important. And uh, especially in an age when we get more politicized and even militarized humanitarian action, at the same time, in some extent, less political support. And there's this terrible balance of having to have political support without being politicized, and I think that's a major issue which we are seeing in Syria and other situations acutely. 
I still would suggest that there are probably more no-go areas where we're not getting where we're needed in more major situations today than any time in recent decades. It's mainly internally displaced and related populations from conflict, I would think. Certainly in terms of protection, you don't hear anyone talking about protecting IDPs in Syria, for example, or in South <coughs> Southern Sudan, for that matter. You, 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 talk you talk about aid because that's what, we, that's what we think of. And I think there's a lack of a balance there, perhaps there's a whole dilemma of non-state actors. I mean, certainly where I work, we deal with non-states more than states by far. Um, usually with the, the support of states who tell us we shouldn't really do it, but it's all right. Um, those are really difficult, uh, I think, major, major questions. And I, I also think the point about uh, negotiation, dialogue, expertise is, is, is critical. We hear a lot of talk about dialogue, but who's doing it? In some cases, it's um, with great respect to the military, to the to the rebel military, <laughs> or, or whatever. So I think that's an area which is relatively unexplored, and the fact that the international system doesn't seem to really address conflict prevention in any way, like it might. Peacekeeping doesn't prevent <coughs> conflicts. So, having been in a few peacekeeping operations, you don't prevent conflicts. You try and keep them apart. But the conflict prevention aspect is relatively un untouched, I would suggest, by the international system. Anyway, that's an arbitrary random non-list. Um, and I'm going to ask the panel to add some structure in order to <laughs> <Sarah>. <laughs> <laughs> Um No, I think we had actually quite a lot of consensus in the, um, on the panel in terms of what we see as uh, the key elements, you know, to um, well, first of all, define what is the access uh, we're looking for as humanitarian organizations mm. and how to go about it. And I think, you know, there is consensus about the fact that, you know, uh, the access is not just about being there at all costs, but it is about, you know, seeing to, you know, what extent you can be of assistance, you know, to an affected population and, you know, um, ensure that there is a protective benefit for them. Um, there's a lot of, I think, of uh, agreement that uh, where these, uh, um, situations are uh, um, complex and difficult, the importance of understanding you know, the, um, the normative framework is very important because it allows you to have informed negotiations with the people that may be uh, blocking you know, your access to the populations. Um, and is you know, about you know, having the, the capacity of engaging in these negotiations, is the capacity of uh, uh, you know, pursuing this, uh, uh, this engagement in, uh, um, in an impartial way. And, and I think the, the impartiality has been another uh, key sort of dominant trait of this discussion, you know, emphasizing that um, as much as we're driven by the principle of humanity in pursuing access at any cost, you know, even without consent, uh, it is important to balance that you know, with, uh, um, with the principle of, of impartiality. I think there's a, a number of other things that you know, we mm -hmm. have uh, discussed across, uh, across the panel and, and, and the importance of really investing you know, resources, investing time, investing in engaging um, has been, you know, very, uh, I, I think, agreed by, by all of us. And supporting <coughs> those who are on the front line, I'm always struck by how many um, very you know, young uh, staff we put at the forefront of uh, um, situations often where women. you actually need, <laughs> often women, but you, know, you need the, the expertise um, that you know, often comes with experience and with age. Um, but then we don't offer them, you know, the training, the support, the backup that is required to conduct, you know, these negotiations in the best possible way. And understanding who we're engaging with, you know, mm. understanding who, who we, uh, our interlocutors are, you know, and, uh, learning more about them, finding out more about them, you know, um, sort of holding them to account. I think those are some of the things that I, um, I take from, uh, from the discussion. Um, what this means for, you know, the, the, the actors that continue to populate the humanitarian landscape, as we like to call it, rather than system. Um, I think it's all to be seen. I think it's important to um, understand more from, you know, the traditions that are different from ours, learn what, you know, can be positively added to our own traditions. But it, it, again, I think impartiality will once again define the way um, in which they are seen on the ground by the communities that they uh, aim to, to support. But mm -hmm. Mark and Brian. Okay. Mark, you want to? Yeah, I, uh, maybe just, uh, uh, I'm not going to try and wrap up, maybe uh, to add, inject a note of pessimism uh, uh, with a, a few, th two things I really haven't heard yet. And uh, one is, you know, it, well, we all agree about this need for acceptance. Uh, and there's, a, there's some new challenges out there to acceptance that, that we're looking at. One is kidnapped for ransom. 
Um, it is a growing industry. It has an almost perfect business model. Uh, it, it is an it, 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 enormously uh, productive uh, industry in places like Somalia. Um, and it, it, it's growing. Uh, and it, it will grow. And it will grow in the places where it looks like it's growing is right across West the Africa. heart of, of our operations. Uh, you know, northern Nigeria now, yeah. West Africa, Mali, Chad, uh, uh, Niger. These are places where we need access and where we need access with the very people uh, who appear to uh, be worth the most money. Um, second is, uh, you know, a, a little while ago, Sarah mentioned that, you know, in Rakhine right now, we've had this horrible violence between, uh, you know, sort of the Buddhist community and the Muslim community or the Rakhine community. And, you know, it, 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 the impact on MSF, uh, you know, we did, we, we were very, very, very large in Rakhine, uh, uh, have huge medical programming for a year. And just, a, a, you know, a, a decrease in 2012 of by almost uh, 250,000 medical consultations. That's how, you know, uh, you know, 48% down just because of this explosion of violence. But the, what, what I want to highlight is we weren't seen as neutral. And one of the things that I think is, is changing uh, 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 is, uh, you know, hashtag MSF supports Muslims. Hmm. You know, it was the use of digital media. We can negotiate with actors, but how do you negotiate yeah. with a mob when the digital media, when Facebook and Twitter are talking about you? We, and th my point is, we no longer control the narrative over who we are. And I, 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 I shudder to think about what would have happened in, in um, Rwanda you know, mid-April 1994, if, if Twitter had been available. Because our teams got out with significant numbers of, of, of Tutsi staff, and I just don't think that would have happened. I, I think, it, you know, very clear, we, uh, well, mm -hmm. can't, you can't speculate. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, another note of, it's just there is a new model there. There are agencies who are saying, well, we'll go in and we're not going to speak out about what we see inside. Uh, we're not funded by the U.S., we're funded by China, or we're funded by Kuwait, and uh, I think those models will challenge us. Um, but I wouldn't want to oversell their, you know, their, their presence. And I think in the end, there, there is optimism. And the optimism is based on the fact that, you know, in crisis, people need humanitarian assistance, almost by definition. And, you know, uh, for, uh, you know in MSF, we are able, you know, the, 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 the Taliban know who delivered their wives' children. Um, uh, you know, we, we did, uh, along with other agencies and other things. But, you know, we, we are able to deliver something that people need in crisis. And I think at, with that basis, um, you know, the, there, there's basis for optimism because I think in the end, you know, there's an interest on all sides of, of humanitarian access. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. Um, I, I think one of the other points that hasn't been made yet is that <coughs> it's the primary responsi responsibility of the state, the host state, to provide for their own people. Um, and, and that's a message that we also need to reinforce. I mean, the ideal response was the response to the um, to Fukushima, where the Japanese government said, "Listen, we have the capability, we have the resources to look to take care of this uh, the consequences." Now, that's that's the dream situation, which is unlikely to to occur in many other um, contexts. But nonetheless, let's recall that it's the state responsibilities. Um, the, the the next point I'd make in terms of um, uh, access again is to go back to what we talked about proximity the, the the danger with all of this remote management discussion is that you'll get further away from uh, affected populations and the further away the more of a disservice you do so we really need to struggle to get as close as possible in uh, increase the access um, and then um, yeah th there's a the whole question about the, the you know the, the contextualized approach <coughs> um, again I'm sorry, just to, 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 again, in terms of proximity, of course, it's also the MSF model to, you know, to have their staff on the ground as close as possible, as it is the, uh, the ICRC model. Um, then just contextualised, yeah, of course we need to contextualise the approach, but again, the ICRC, given the impact of social media, given the fact that what you do in one part of the world will be seen and understood in the very other part of the world two seconds later, we, we insist on a coherent approach where, again, in terms of access, what we do in one country, we do in, uh, uh, in every other context. Transparency, um, um, negotiation with all parties to the conflict, and in the end of the day, consensus to for us to, to come in and operate. Thanks. Okay. Thank you very much.
Well, we're over time. Uh, thank you all. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Mark. Uh, thank you, Brian. <coughs> Uh, I must say it's nicer to ask the questions than to try and answer them. I quite <laughs> enjoy that role, I must say. <laughs> we know so it is. Right. <laughs> you need someone to ask questions in future, I'm happy to help. But thank you all very much. Sorry we couldn't do justice to everybody uh, or, the, or the subject, but uh, you didn't expect that, I'm sure. So thank you, uh, and uh, thank you especially HPG, Sarah, for hosting us <coughs> today. Thank Pleasure. you very much. Thank you. I'm sorry I have to run away to catch a plane, so... I a lot of friends here, but I'll see you next time. <laughs>